Hello guys and welcome back. Let's do a recap video this time. Hello everyone and welcome back to Z80 Dreams. As you can see I got quite a collection of Max and this isn't even my full collection of compact Max. I have a few more. But these are the major models that I have. Uh, you have seen the Plus in an earlier video. Uh, this is the SC, SC30 and the Classic. Now, which one of these should I focus on if I want to make them work perfectly? Well, of course, the Plus here is fantastic. Uh, it's the earliest Mac that I have. It uh, came out in uh, 1986. And it has a whopping one megabyte of RAM memory and a processor, a 68,000 processor, running at 8 megahertz. I have the SC here, uh, that was uh, an improved version of the Plus. The SC was built when Steve Jobs uh, left Apple. And they added a fan to this, so it could keep cool and not heat itself to, uh, to the point where it was killing itself. Uh, it has the same processor running at almost the same speed, uh, but you can upgrade it from one megabyte uh, of RAM up to four megabytes. So it's a little bit better. It's a bit noisier as well uh, because of the fan. But in this one, it's, you have a hard disk drive. You don't have a hard disk drive in the Plus. So that was an improvement uh, by Apple. You could choose if you wanted a hard disk drive or if you wanted a second floppy, you see you can remove the front plate here where the LED is to add a second floppy. Uh, and it could also read, it, it got the super drive floppy, so it could read a bit uh, bigger format uh, uh, floppies. The SC30 uh, is an improvement again over the SC. Uh, it has another processor, a 68030 uh, processor, also from Motorola. Which is, instead of, this is a 16-bit machine, this is a 16-bit machine, this is a 32-bit machine. You could say. Uh, at least the addressing mode is different. Uh, the ROM is putting some limitation on that. But for all intents and purposes, you could call it a 32-bit uh, machine. Now, uh, the first 32-bit machine that Apple released was the Apple II X, and X was marking the better processor. So when they built this machine, they figured they couldn't call it the SEX, the Macintosh SEX. That would be a huge disaster, so they call it the SE30 instead. Uh, you could upgrade up to 128 megabyte of RAM in this, so it was a huge leap from 4 megabyte of RAM to 128. It came with uh, 1 megabyte installed, uh, this machine has been upgraded, I don't know to how much, maybe maybe it has 16 meg of RAM or something, I'm not sure, I have to open it and take a look. Uh, then came the Macintosh Classic, which was not an improvement over any machine, but a cheaper version. So they basically took the SC and put it in a, another case. Um, the logic board is a bit smaller, everything is more streamlined, so it's uh, easier to manufacture. So, yeah, it, it's uh, not in... Uh, I would not call it an improvement, uh, although it is later than the SC30. The SC30 is still, in my opinion, the best compact Mac. And I don't have the Classic 2, unfortunately. But... Uh, for what I have read, the SC30 is still better than the uh, Classic 2, which also come, came later. Uh, so if we take the years, this is 86, 87, 89 and 1990. So this is the Mac that I use the most. But I have started to notice some problems with it. Well, first of all, uh, the hard disk drive crashed, so I swapped it out uh, for an SD card. And you can buy this SD card to SCSI interface, and it's a bit fiddly to set up. 
and I didn't have a mounting bracket uh, so I don't have a good mounting solution for it. But now I have also seen that the screen is starting to behave uh, strangely and it cannot access the memory as it should. When I opened this I saw that some of the surface mounted capacitors, the surface mounted aluminum electrolytic capacitors had started to leak. And of course I panicked and I went to my uh, favorite online store and I bought some caps. So, first of all I have some true hole mounted here and two different values here as well. Uh, and they are only, these are axial ones, uh, there are only two uh, different values for these in the SC30. More importantly I wanted to replace the surface mounted ones. So I got here some tantalum capacitors and they are tiny. Uh, there are two values. There is a 47 microfarad and a one, oh sorry, 4.7, no, 47 microfarad and one microfarad. So there are two different values of these. And I have to uh, sort them on the logic board. I have to remove the old ones before they cause any more damage. Uh, so let's get started. So first of all I have to open the Macintosh and I use the a Torx screw, screwdriver here. There are two screws at the bottom. Uh, they are black ones and then there are two screws at the top. It's a bit fiddly to get it because my Torx screwdriver is not nearly long enough but uh, it works, so that's uh, that's a good thing. So they are stuck in there, and I have to tilt the entire Mac to get the screws up. One of them got out there, so now I'm just loosening the second one, and there it came. So we are ready to open the lid. After that I just need to remove the RF shield and all the cables inside. This is the power cable, the floppy cable uh, and least but not last the SCSI cable, the big one. I have actually cheated here and removed them before recording this because otherwise it would take far too long time. This is the SCSI to SD device, it's just flapping there in the wind, put some towel around it. After that, it's just a matter of taking the logic board out, and unlike Apple's of today, this is really easy. You just pop it out a little bit, and it's like a little hinge, you take it out like that. So here is finally the logic board. This is the processor, the Motorola 68K, uh, or 68000. Here are some glue logic the video ROM and here is a floating point uh, math coprocessor, the Motorola 6882 and without this you have to do all the floating point uh, calculations in software instead and you have to keep the exponent and the mantissa in separate vari variables and so on so this helps a lot with that and as you can see there are two times four eight uh, SIM slots. It says SIM 1, 2, 3 and 4 and they are all filled. Uh, so the, uh, I don't think it's uh, maxed out to 128k but at least all the slots are maxed out. And there is a separate uh, RAM memory for the video here. So this is the video RAM uh, or ROM SIM as it says here. Uh, the capacitors that I need to replace are this one, uh, it's a axial uh, true hole mounted one and these surface mounted uh, electrolytic ones here, four of them here, they are all 47 uh, microfarad, one tiny little 
electrolytic uh, el aluminum electrolytic here that is one microfarad 347s here one here and yet another true hole mounted axial capacitor here so that's all that i need to replace you might also be wondering why this battery is empty well the reason is very simple i don't want the battery to start leak and you know spew its uh, acidic content all over the board so i remove the battery uh, the real time clock here this little chip will obviously not work without the battery but on the other hand i don't need it because if i want to know what time it is i can just uh, look at my watch uh, there is a expansion slot here this is a called a processor direct slot so this is basically pins straight in to the processor and that was uh, the first method of expanding computers that apple used the new bus came later so um, you have if you buy a expansion uh, for the processor direct slot it only fits the specific computer that you bought it for so for example if i find an expansion for the macintosh fc it won't fit in here because this has another processor so what i'm doing here is that i'm first applying some flux to both sides of the capacitor that i want to remove and the reason is that the leaders the pins uh, for this surface mount capacitor is on the sides and i want to remove the oxides uh, from it before i do anything else so here comes the soldering iron and I'm heating up the flux and I'm heating up the uh, solder as well. And since this is quite old uh, work, it's from the 80s, it's, it's a lot of oxides on the solder itself. And I couldn't really heat it as much as I wanted to. Uh, if you do this kind of work, by the way, you should really use a fan to extract all the fumes. You see uh, lots of smoke coming up and uh, it contains uh, heavy metals and it's really not healthy for you. Uh, it comes both from the solder and from the flux. What I have in my hand there is a soldering braid and I use that to remove all the solder. So I'm trying to heat properly. Uh, I really don't have the right tip for this. Uh, I should have a chisel tip, but I only have this cone shaped tip. Uh, after I finished this video, I had bought more tips already. And uh, here I'm trying to get it loose, but it's still a bit stuck. So I need to remove uh, more solder. I'm trying to heat it first without using the soldering braid. And then I'm bringing in the soldering braid again later to suck up the the solder so yeah here it comes and uh, unfortunately uh, I was recording this with my camera and then someone called me in the middle of everything so the recording stopped and uh, yeah that that happened and after that it was I just picked it up using tweezers so this new tantalum capacitor is really really tiny on the old uh, aluminum uh, electrolytic capacitor the marked side the black side is the negative side and on the tantalum capacitor is a little black line on the positive side so you really need to put it the right way i'm putting some more flux on the contact points just to clean it and remove all the oxides before i put a new capacitor in place uh, the good thing about tantalum capacitor is that they don't start leaking the same way as uh, aluminum electrolytic capacitors do uh, but they still have the same range uh, you can get them in very high values i'm putting some uh, solder on the pads there just to prepare myself because i cannot hold the capacitor and the soldering iron and the solder uh, at the same time i need three hands for that so i just put some solder on the pads there to start with then i'm bringing in the capacitor make sure it's the right side the little marked line you cannot see it in the video but there is a marked line that marking the positive side or the anode 
of the capacitor. So now I'm holding it with a tweezer and heating the solder just to make it stuck. And it's a little bit fiddly. Uh, <laughs> I have to try again uh, because I was uh, the tweezers was in the way. I was almost uh, soldering the tweezers uh, to the PCB. So I'm trying to hold it uh, in another way from the top and see if that works better. And one more try. Heating the solder and make sure that it stacks and heating the other side and make sure that it stacks to the capacitor. And then I'm just pushing a little bit on the top of the capacitor to push it down while I'm heating both sides. Uh, so that it really floats down and there it is uh, it uh, looks very good if i say so myself uh, i'm making some uh, visual inspection there just to see that it uh, actually make contact between the pads uh, on the pcb and the pads on the capacitor then it's just a matter of uh, cleaning up uh, after myself because i don't want the um, I don't want the solder rests or the flux, uh, the rest of the flux uh, to be there. So I'm uh, using a cotton swab and some isopropyl alcohol or IPA just to clean up after myself uh, to make sure that nothing happens uh, to the PCB. So yeah, that's it. And uh, one uh, done and <laughs> the rest to go.
Uh, so the camera actually switched off before I could uh, finish the soldering. The battery was uh, finished, but rest assured I got this capacitor here and this capacitor here uh, replaced. Uh, the wires for the capacitor was slightly too wide to fit into the holes in the PCB, so that's why I struggled a bit, but now it's there and it's in place. And I have in, uh, inspected all of these uh, small tantalum capacitors. Uh, I have double checked that the polarity are the right way uh, and that the soldering joints are okay. So yeah, just uh, it's just uh, to install it then. So when I install the logic board, I first start with the cable for the speaker. And you can see also that I have uh, reinserted all the RAM modules uh, there, although there seems to be some problem with them, so I need to take them out again and properly clean them, because it doesn't seem to make proper contact with the RAM sticks. You just insert it like a hinge again and push it down like that. It's uh, really easy to install. After that, it's just a matter of inserting all the cables again. First the cable to the floppy drive. The thin one, uh, the super drive. Uh, then I'm inserting the power cable, the fat one. And you have to push a bit to get this on, uh, in. It's a, uh, it's a little. It should click when it goes in, like that. And least but not last, the SCSI cable that goes to the uh, SCSI to SD, the so-called hard disk drive, although it's a SD card. Uh, so that's uh, really it. Then we just need to put the lid on again. So that was all, all for this time. I will not switch this on because I have lots of other things to do. Uh, one of them is looking at the analog board to see that that one is fit for fight. And I also seem to have some problem with the memory sticks for this computer. So I'm gonna look into that. Uh, but yeah. Please subscribe if you haven't done so, like the video if you find this kind of content uh, useful and fun to watch. And uh, don't forget to follow me on Instagram and Facebook as well. Until next time, 